Well, listen, I'm I'm uh, thrilled to be able to bring you both together. I, your reputations, of course, precede uh, precede themselves. Uh, but at the same time, I did spend uh, time with both of you to give a little bit of background. Uh, Erwin, uh, of course, as I mentioned, uh, Deepak's work uh, centers around fostering a more peaceful, just, sustainable, healthy, and joyful world. And uh, I do believe that there is much crossover in terms of what we are trying to achieve. And I agree with Deepak's proposition that peace will be created by those who are at peace with themselves. Uh, and one other thing that I would note is that Deepak is particularly interested in visiting Israel and, and doing his part to foster peace in the region. Um, but having said that, uh, you know, maybe I'll turn it over to you, Deepak, to give a little bit of background, and then then perhaps uh, Professor Kotler can chime in. And uh, I'll be I'll be somewhat of a fly in the wall, but also a participant. But just looking forward to uh, uh, the two of you uh, getting into it a little bit. So I'm actually very curious uh, uh, about your work, Jay, as well, and of course uh, very keen to learn from. Uh, Professor Kotler. I am not a scholar. I'm a medical doctor whose main interest is in uh, these days in what we call the hard problem of consciousness. But uh, having, uh, you know, looked at the mind body relationship and consciousness is fundamental to every experience we have including the experience that we call science, I have um, started working in small areas in my own little way on conflict resolution. So um, I've employed these techniques on conflict resolution when there's tension between, say, uh, the ethnic or racial tension in schools between black and whites, or occasionally I've worked with children, uh, both from Palestine and Israel, uh, but not on a big scale. And uh, I have a particular way that I approach this uh, idea of conflict resolution. I recently made a, a proposal even to world leaders with no response. But this morning, actually, I uh, spoke on CNN International about how we could create a grassroots movement for global peace because we really can't depend, as far as I think, we, <laughs> we can't depend on leaders that are officially leaders. They all seem to be gangsters um, engaged in uh, uh, power mongering, influence peddling, cronyism, corruption, and bureaucracy. So I, I thought maybe there's a way to take our personal um, resolution of conflicts and the methodologies that we use in personal relationships to a community level or even a grassroots uh, uh, movement globally. And so I'll just share with you some of the things that we um, teach or I teach when I work with communities or people engaged in uh, some kind of conflict or the other. The first thing that we explore is how can we be peaceful ourselves? How can we speak peace, create peace, be peace, and resolve conflicts in our own life? And in that area, I use nine principles. Number one, no matter who your adversary is or who you're in conflict with, uh, start with respect. If you don't respect them in your conversation, you lose them in the first minute. Number two, recognize that there's a perception of injustice on both sides. Otherwise, there wouldn't be conflict. Number three, uh, be able to forgive and be able to ask for forgiveness um, and expose your vulnerability. Number four, don't be belligerent. Number five, use the well-known techniques of emotional intelligence, getting in touch with your own emotions, getting in touch with the other's emotions, and using non-conflict, uh, non-violent communication as uh, 
taught by many other people. What am I observing? What am I feeling? What do I need? How do we mutually fulfill our needs? So uh, belligerence is replaced by um, emotional intelligence. Number five, um, don't uh, stereotype or use labels uh, because uh, you know that automatically creates separation. Um, then you know number seven is try not to prove the other person wrong. They'll never forgive you. And so understand that you just have different perspectives. Uh, number eight, something like uh, uh, recognize that there's fear on both sides. Number nine, that uh, um, also don't engage in ideological or religious uh, discussions because you never uh, will agree anyway. So the focus is uh, what do we want? Um, and I think we want peace, we want prosperity, we want health, we want well-being, and we want joy. Now, as I said, with small groups, I've been able to succeed in some of these uh, conflicts, whether they're ethnic or racial, but mostly with younger people and never with the uh, politicians. Uh, that's my experience so far. <laughs> and I want to learn uh, a little bit about your work, Jay, and how it relates to the work that uh, Professor Kotler is talking about. So over to you, Jay, and then to Professor Kotler. Well, thank you, uh, Deepak. And uh, I look forward to uh, collaborating with you on many, many projects in 2023. I'm, I'm certainly very inspired by your approach and, and your teachings. Um, well, as you know, I'm the chair of the board of the Raul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights, which was established by Professor Kotler a number of years ago uh, after uh, he uh, had left uh, Parliament, after being a member of Parliament uh, and Minister of Justice uh, at one point, an Attorney General, and had an illustrious career uh, in Parliament and prior to that. Um, and throughout his career, in, including during his parliamentary days, um, he's been an international uh, human rights champion representing political prisoners all around the world and uh, fighting for peace all around the world, uh, essentially. Um, so uh, given my role as chair of the board of, of the Raw Wallenberg Center, I thought it would be uh, apropos uh, that now that I've established a relationship with you, um, and I'm looking to do uh, much more work uh, to support your foundation and, and, and uh, your activities that we combine forces somehow uh, in the pursuit of uh, really the, the areas that uh, you wish to foster for our world, including most obviously uh, justice and peace. Um, so that's kind of the perspective I come at it from, but you know that I have a, a broader background, of course, as well in in business and uh, in, in tech consulting and a number of other areas. Uh, but in terms of the human rights work that I do, I really uh, use uh, the, and, and support the Raw Wallenberg Center uh, for Human Rights as, as a foundation for all of that. Over to you, Professor Codler. Well, you know, I, I, I'd like to ask both of you to call me here when I feel better. And that will allow me, if I may, to call uh, as Shobhan Deepak and, and sure. personal one, uh, one more thing one more thing at, I would at the add risk to... of being presumptive but I just no, no, I right. think it's a good idea that's one way to resolve conflicts is to <laughs> be personal <laughs> friends yes right. one more thing I would add and and it and it relates to uh my habit in calling Erwin uh, Professor Kotler is that uh he was actually my professor uh, at McGill Law School many many years ago, and and that's that's sort of how we met, and we've we've become dear friends uh, ever since, and and have been supportive of one another for uh, for decades now. Thanks, Jay. You know what, uh, uh, Deepak? When I was listening to you, I I uh, was reminded of two things. One, uh, an article you wrote in the uh, New York Times, I think, about a little over uh, two years ago, uh, which, which contained uh, points about how we could be peaceful interlocutors, which led into what I felt was 
uh, an approach to a grassroots a movement uh, for global peace. But I, I have to tell you that the thing that struck me when I uh, both read that article and heard you now and uh, also some of your uh, webinars, as I, I mentioned, uh, <clears throat> that I saw with Jonathan and Marion Williamson, what struck me was how it reflected and represented so much of the learning that I got from uh, my parents of, of, of blessed memory, uh, which really accounts uh, for anything good that I've been able uh, to do in life for the that which is not good, I take full responsibility for. But it was my father who, who taught me uh, at a very young age when I was too young to understand the profundity of, of his uh, teachings, when he said to me that uh, the pursuit of justice, as he put it, and he used the Hebraic approach, tzedek, 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 the pursuit of justice, he put it, is equal to all the other commandments combined. He said, this must be your life's mission. And this is what you must teach onto your children. But it was my mother who, when she would hear my father saying these things, would say to me that if you want to pursue justice, you have to understand, you have to feel the injustice about you. You have to go in and about your community and feel the injustice and combat the injustice. Otherwise, she said the pursuit of justice will just be a kind of theoretical abstraction. So I, I suspect because of the early teachings of my parents, and I happen to have had good follow-up education um, <clears throat> in high school and, and, and university. One of my teachers in high school was a, a Canadian a poet who was in charge of all our uh, secular studies, including physics and chemistry, which means to this day I've learned very little about physics and chemistry, but a good deal about uh, poetry, uh, the humanities, and the like. And he uh, reminded me in his uh, both his visage and in his uh, speaking, uh, like the prophet Jeremiah. And I know you made reference uh, to the prophets and in, in some of your exchanges. So he had a big influence on me, and he also taught uh, Leonard Cohn our Canadian uh, poet, songwriter, and the like, and brought us two together at a young age and referred to both of us as his spiritual children. So there was a strong bond there, not only in school, but outside of it. And then I suspect because of these teachings, as a student, I got involved in the two great human rights struggles of the second half of the 20th century, the struggle against apartheid, and the struggle for uh, human rights in the then former Soviet Union. And that led me when I became a, to be a law professor uh, to be involved in the two political prisoners that represented uh, these two struggles, Nelson Mandela in South Africa and Anatoly Sharansky as he then was in the former Soviet Union. And one of the incredible things about that is the intersection of those two uh, cases and causes. Uh, very briefly, I was uh, arrested and uh, detained and expelled from the Soviet Union in 1979. I had gone there because the Canadian government had arranged for me to appear in a Soviet court on behalf of uh, Sharansky. But before that could take place, as I said, I was arrested and uh, expelled. I won't go into that other than to say in 1981, I was invited to South Africa as a guest of the anti-apartheid uh, movement. And there in South Africa, Sharansky was well known. Um, he was almost as a kind of a cause celeb because South Africa had this anti-communist idiom and they seized on Sharansky as being a kind of role model uh, for them to uh, promote. And so when I was asked to speak about the Sharansky case, I said, you know, I'd like to speak about the Sharansky case, but I'd, I'd rather speak about uh, Nelson Mandela uh, because I'm here in South Africa. I said, but I don't want to get anybody in trouble. I know that he's a banned person. Any reference uh, to him is illegal. But there were some courageous students then um, at Whitworthstown University, Vitz University for short. And they said, no, no, let, let's do that. And uh, uh, I spoke on the topic, if uh, Sharansky, why not? Mandela. And uh, at the end of the talk, when my wife came up to speak to me, uh, she then describes it, I wasn't there because I got arrested in, 
in, in South Africa. And uh, while being, <laughs> and while I, this is how the two cases intersect. And while I uh, was being detained, the prison warden came to me and said, uh, do you know the foreign minister? Pig Bota, and I said no. And he said, "Well, he's asked us uh, to bring you to him." And so I went to uh, his office, and as I walked in, he looked at me and pointed to a big portrait on the wall, and he said, "You know who that is, don't you?" I said, "Yes, that's Anatoly Sharansky." He said, "Right." I couldn't understand, and I can't understand how somebody like you can defend a great hero like. Anatoly Sharansky, who's fighting against our common enemy, the communist Soviet Union, and in the same breath, take up the case of Nelson Mandela, who is our enemy, who is also a, a communist. And so I couldn't understand how you could be taking up both these cases and speak of them in the same breath. And I said to him, I said, Mr. Bota, uh, both Sharansky and Mandela are fighting for the same thing. I said, they're both fighting for freedom. They're both fighting for human rights. They're both fighting for equality. They're both fighting uh, for peace. And so while the Soviet Union may be a major human rights violator, I said, South Africa is the only post-World War II country that has institutionalized racism as a matter of law. I said, South Africa is, is not, uh, apartheid is not only a racist philosophy, it's a racist legal regime. He then, uh, said to me after a long conversation in which he tried to persuade me of the virtues of the uh, separate but equal and that South Africa was really a democracy, and then said, you know, I could I imprison you or expel you, but because of any point to Sharansky's picture, I'm going to let you go about South Africa, speak to who you want, see who you want, come back. He said, he said when, when are you leaving South Africa? I said, in 12 days. He says, come back just before you leave and see me. Uh, tell me if we're not a democratic you know, South Africa. I came back, I saw him and he said, so young man, what do you have to say? I said, well, you're right. I said, South Africa is democratic and equal. He said, see, I told you, I said, if you're white, I said, if you're black or colored, the situation is even worse than I thought. And then he mentioned what he had said before. Well, you're a, a brash young man. And I said to him, I have to tell you, I said, for so long as it takes from wherever I am, I'm going to fight against this racist regime until it is dismantled. And what happened is that uh, that whole exchange and everything got some press and I was approached by the then head of Mandela's legal team, uh, Izzy Meisels, and asked uh, to join it as part of the international uh, advocacy group. And that you know, and engaged me in both cases. Uh, but the incredible follow-up to all of this, and that dovetails with what you were saying, uh, is that years later, I was back in South Africa. I used to come every few years for a reunion of the International Legal Group. And I thought I, I'd look up Pig Bota and just, you know, uh, recall our com I called him, and it turned out that he was in a senior citizen's home. And then he said to me something very fascinating and something in a certain sense, very hopeful. He said, you know, he said, uh, you have not known what has happened to me. He said, I've been following you. He said, you were a brash young man, repeated the same thing. Uh, but then said, but you might not know about me. He said, well, let me tell you. He said, I became uh, the first uh, minister in Mandela's government. He said, I became the first minister to speak out against apartheid. And he said, and I became a member of the African National Congress. And so it indicated to me that uh, people can change. And if they're engaged uh, properly, I can't say <laughs> the fact that I followed, you know, your nine steps in my exchanges with him. But I mean, uh, it was encouraging to see how he had evolved. But then to get back with this, I'll close. Uh, my mother was very much committed to peace. She was the embodiment of your teachings, if I can put it that way. She was a person of incredible inner peace. I never heard her say a bad word about anybody in my life. I can say that. I never heard her say a bad word about anybody. Sometimes some people were surprised that she would find the good even in those that, you know, 
they could not see the good in. And one of the things that she was very, very passionate about, there were two things. One was the civil rights movement in the US. And so when I was a, did graduate work there, uh, I got involved in the uh, civil rights uh, movement and in the peace movement. And I suspect that's why I became at McGill at the time we had the CUCND, Combined Universities Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament. So I got involved in that. that my connection with Jonathan Granoff has gone on uh, on, that, on that issue and Jay connected us as, as well in, in that regard. But the main thing for her, a real passion, her passion throughout her life was for an Israeli Arab Palestinian peace. And I suspect that uh, this was partly responsible for the fact that uh, as a law professor in the summers of 75, 76, 77, 78, I went to live and work in the Arab countries. I, the word Arab is too generic. Uh, I was in Egypt, uh, Jordan, uh, Syria, Palestinian territories, and I ended up uh, in Israel. And I have to say that uh, that experience, with this I close, had a transformative impact on, on my life. Uh, as I'll tell you, in 19, summer of 75 and in summer of 76, I began my uh, visits uh, with the first month being at the Institute uh, for uh, Political and Peace Studies at al Ahram in, in Cairo. And the person who was heading it up at the time was Boutrous, Boutrous Ghali, then went on to become the foreign minister to Sadat and then Secretary General of the UN. When I came back in 1977, uh, again, I was started my trip in, in Cairo. When I was in Cairo, uh, the Likud government got elected in Israel with Menachem Begin as prime minister. And Boutrous, Boutrous Ghali, with whom I had become friendly in 75 and 76, knowing that I ended up my trip to the Arab countries uh, in Israel, then uh, asked me to meet with President Sadat. We had uh, several uh, meetings and President Sadat surprised me one day when he asked me if I would deliver a message to then Prime Minister uh, Begin. And I said to him, well, President Sadat, as I mentioned to you, I, I don't know uh, Prime Minister Begin. He said, I know you said you don't know him, but I know that you end up your trips, as Boutrous, Boutrous Ghali has told me, in Israel. And I suspect that you'll find a way uh, to be able uh, to get this message to him. And I want to send it uh, with somebody who will be trusted by the Israelis and whom I will trust. And I don't want to go through official channels uh, for this uh, purpose. And so he gave me this message and uh, I cut my trip to the Arab countries short that summer. I went from Egypt, I had to go to Syria, but then I went straight uh, to Israel. The day that I arrived in Israel, I bumped into a friend of mine who invited me, and this is why I say it had a transformative effect on my life, as you'll see, who invited me to a meeting of uh, members of, of, of Knesset, of the Israeli uh, parliament. Uh, unknown to me, uh, the person who I would meet at that lunch ended up becoming my wife. Uh, she was then the uh, parliamentary secretary for uh, the Likud party and very close to the prime minister, Menachem Begin. So I entered this lunch with others and the person who invited me all of a sudden said, you know, we have Erwin Kotler here. I'm going to ask him to say a few words about uh, North American Jews. So I got up and I spoke in, in Hebrew and I said, you know, you've heard enough about North American Jews. I said, I've just come from uh, Egypt and, and Syria. Let me share with you some reflections on that. I didn't go into the fact that I had this message or anything. And... Um, as my wife then told me the story, when I started speaking in Hebrew and spoke about having been in Egypt and Syria, and at that time there were no relations between uh, Israelis and, and Egypt and Syria, Jews weren't traveling there, she wrote a note to a friend of hers at the table that I must be a spy. And so after the lunch, she came up and started to question me, and I, I sensed that she was had these suspicions, I said to her at that point, I said, let me share with you something that I hadn't said on, at lunch. I said, uh, when I was in Syria, I met with the, uh, the Jewish community there and uh, they drank a, a toast to the fact that 
uh, Begin became uh, the Prime Minister of Israel because they said to me that they believed that with Prime Minister Begin would come their redemption. And so I say this to her, and her eyes open up, and she said, you must tell this to the Prime Minister. He has to know. It's very important for him to know this. I said, well, which was true. Well, I don't know the Prime Minister. She said, I will arrange it. The next day I was sitting in the office of the Israeli uh, Prime Minister, and after we speak, uh, I, after a few moments, I say to him, I have something you know, that I need to share with you, but it has to be in utter confidence. I can't have anybody else in the room. And I got a look from her that I've since experienced uh, in our marriage. In other words, uh, I arranged this thing. You're asking me uh, to leave. I, I then shared with him the note, which was said that President Sadat was prepared to enter into peace negotiations uh, with Prime Minister Begin. Uh, with a view to uh, bringing about Israeli withdrawal from the Sinai, from the Sinai Peninsula, and recognition of the legitimate rights of the Palestinian people. Now, I remember Begin's face as he read the note. I can still see it now. And like, well, like, this is not possible. I can't agree to these things. So I said to him, I said, uh, Prime Minister, I said, he didn't ask you uh, to uh, agree to these as outcome conditions. He said, these are his uh, conditions for entering into negotiations. So then he said to me, uh, let me ask you the question that he put to you. Do you think I can make peace with President Sadat? And I said, yes. And in particular, I said, because his wife, I said, it was sometimes in our meetings, very much wants peace. And so he gave me uh, a note to go back to Egypt that he was prepared to enter into peace negotiations and in effect the rest is history my wife and i married on march 25th 1979 which was the day of the egyptian israeli peace treaty and so that engaged my involvement um, in the israeli arab palestinian peace process which continues to the present day and one last anecdote because i don't want to take and i've already taken too much time about 15 months ago I went to visit with Riyad Malki, the foreign minister of the Palestinian Authority. And again, what you were saying reminds me of that visit, and I'll say why in a moment. I, I had met Riyad Malki because when I was Minister of Justice, uh, that Jay referenced, uh, the, the Prime Minister at the time in the Canadian government, Paul Martin, um, agreed and, and even encouraged my desire to go visit with the ministers of justice of uh, Egypt, and Jordan and Israel and the Palestinian Authority and invite them to what we call the Justice Summit that would be hosted by Canada. I felt that that Justice Summit could hopefully have a peace dividend. And so everything was organized, all had agreed, the agenda had been agreed, et cetera, et cetera, except uh, our government lost the election and then the subsequent government uh, didn't want to follow up on it, you know, some of the things you say about politicians and you're absolutely uh, right. Uh, but Riyad Malki was then the head of a Palestinian civil society group called Panorama. He and I became friends. I kept returning regularly to the Palestinian Authority because I was interested in uh, peace discussions and the like. And at one point he said to me in uh, 2007, look Erwin, I, I wanna leave at Palestine, he said, Palestinian Authority is corrupt. He says, can you get me a job in Canada? I said, Riyadh, if you leave, then you're leaving it to those who you say are corrupt. Better to engage and see what you can reform. So he stayed and ended up, as I said, as foreign minister. I was working for years and going back and forth between the Israeli government and the Palestinian Authority, was meeting with Abbas, was meeting with Netanyahu. At some points, I thought we got close to something. But then in 2000, 15, it all ended. And they weren't in discussions at all. Which brings me to why I went to see Malki uh, last uh, July or 15 months ago, because I felt at the time that while they weren't in discussions, uh, there was a pandemic. Uh, health issues don't have borders. Environmental issues don't have borders. So I went to meet with Riyad Malki and he said, look, you know, we have no discussions with the Israelis. I said, I know that. I said, but I'm, I'm here to speak to you about two things. Will you agree that the ministers of health and the ministers of environment come together? 
because there's no borders on these things. And both the Palestinians and the Israelis have a joint, a joint need for shared involvement on the health issues and on the, to sum it up, uh, 10 days later, ministers of health and environment met Israeli and Palestinian. That I thought would be the beginning of maybe the movement towards uh, starting a peace negotiation again, but that didn't happen. And now I think things are more difficult uh, than ever, uh, given uh, what has happened on both sides. And what is desperately needed is all the things that you have mentioned. In terms of we, if we can develop with each of them, if, if the Israelis and Palestinian leaders could follow your nine points and would exchange in that manner and uh, with that kind of uh, integrity, uh, we could maybe restart that process, which brings me to the point that I think if you could make a visit to the region uh, and speak to the leadership on both sides, which I would try to facilitate, maybe we could get something uh, going uh, at this point. So first of all, Erwin, thank you for sharing those stories. They're absolutely astonishing and just show that one voice, and in this case yours, could make such a huge difference uh, in South Africa, in Israel, for Palestine as well. And as usual, there are always hiccups along the way, but the fact that you've persisted all these years uh, in the cause of justice of all kinds um, and freedom, um, and that it has worked shows that there is hope. So I have a couple of questions right now. You know, when you look at the world right now, what's happening in Ukraine, what's happening in Russia, what's happening in Brazil, what's happening even in some of the uh, right-wing fundamentalism and, uh, and, uh, and almost Nazism emerging again in, uh, in Europe. Uh, it's a pretty scary uh, scene across the world, not just uh, uh, Israel and Palestine, but India and Pakistan, and also the rest of the world, Europe, so many things happening. Uh, I feel that there's an urgency for a solution. I would love to uh, come to Israel with you and speak to anyone, uh, but we need to combine it with some kind of action and some kind of um, goal at the end, you know, that's measurable, something that we can stretch really uh, into the future beyond what we think we can achieve. Otherwise, what's the point? But something that's measurable, something that we all agree on, something that we can keep a record of, and also something that has some kind of time limitation to it. Otherwise, we'll just keep talking. In other words, create some smart goals. But at the same time, perhaps, as we speak to leaders, um, if that happens, why not hold a couple of uh, public forums, you know, like what we call um, for the general public. Last time I was in Israel, uh, in Tel Aviv, uh, I spoke to the public about something called the soul of leadership. And uh, we had 3000 people in the audience. So I know there's an appetite in the general public. I know there um, uh, I have been to Israel now about four times, uh, but never in any official capacity. But the people I work for there uh, have a very grassroots leadership movement already. So if we could combine some kind of, you know, uh, political uh, dialogue with different parties with a conversation that expands our awareness amongst the general public, where I know there's a lot of enthusiasm for peace, prosperity, health, and well-being. And I think it's very simple. You know, if you ask the general public, do you want peace? They say yes. Do you want prosperity? They say yes. Do you want good health? Yes. Do you want joy? Yes. Do you want your children to go to school? Yes. Do you want you know, your future generations to live in harmony? Yes. So then why don't we do it? 
I mean, you know, if that we have the we have the imagination and the creativity to split the bomb. We have the imagination and creativity to uh, explore interstellar space, to land land people on the moon, to develop artificial intelligence and the new metaverse. And we haven't used that same imagination to create a more peaceful, just, sustainable, healthier, and joyful world. There's something totally insane about that. And, you know, if we don't accept that this insanity, which it covers everything from conflict to mechanized weapons, to cyber hacking, to nuclear weapons, to extinction of species, to poison in the food chain, it's a total mess right now. We're sleepwalking to extinction. And it's time that we created this conversation as a very urgent way. Otherwise, you know, nature might come to the conclusion that the human experiment was interesting evolutionary experiment, but it didn't work. Well, you know, when you talk about uh, sleepwalking to, to extinction, and that was also your metaphor with regard to humans and ants, and uh, what is happening in that regard. Uh, I just want to say you mentioned also the Russia, you, uh, Ukraine. I, I mean, I believe that we are a historical inf inflection moment because of the uh, the resurgent global authoritarianism, the backsliding of democracies, the assault on human rights, and I see political prisoners as a, a looking glass in, in, into all that. So, uh, with regard to Russia and the Ukraine, um, we and uh, Raoul Wallenbergson have been very much involved in uh, trying to uh, establish an independent uh, tribunal uh, for the crime of aggression in Ukraine because the present legal remedies don't allow for uh, that crime to be adjudicated. But that's you know uh, a, a legal thing that will not advance us towards peace. And the things that, and values that you were speaking about, uh, which are crucial, we, we are very much engaged in Raoul Wallenberg Center on, let's say, three um, what I would call case studies of this resurgent global authoritarianism. Uh, <clears throat> Putin's Russia, and I use that term to distinguish it from the people and publics in Russia who are otherwise targets of, of Putin as well, or uh, Khamenei's Iran, uh, and also Xi Jinping's China. So we've been focusing on those three, not to the exclusion of others, but on the political prisoners in, in each of those uh, countries. And I have to tell you that one flicker of hope I've seen uh, has been with all the brutality involved is the manner in which, for example, the people in Iran uh, have been rising up. It's not just the women, it's women and students and environmentalists and, and, and uh, peace uh, protesters and Baha'i, I mean, you, you really see a, uh, maybe a tipping point, I'm not sure, um, but I do believe that solidarity with the Iranian people is crucial and important for them to know that they're not alone and that, uh, you know, we support them in their struggle. Similarly, with regard to uh, Russia, the reason um, we've taken up the case and cause of Vladimir uh, Karamirza, um, is because he is a looking glass into both Russia's massive domestic repression and their external aggression in the Ukraine. I mean, Vladimir Karamirz is sort of the heir to Andrei Sakharov and the dissident movement. He's a leading opposition politician, uh, a journalist, an author, a filmmaker, a historian, incredible person. We became friendly some uh, 12 years ago. Uh, he came. Uh, to Canada when I tabled the first Magnitsky legislation. And he came with uh, Bill Browder and um, Boris Nemtsov, who was then the Russian Democratic opposition leader. Fast forward, uh, Boris Nemtsov was assassinated outside the Kremlin in 2015. We then, I was then a member of parliament, convened the Foreign Affairs Committee to hold hearings about adopting Magnitsky legislation. Uh, Vladimir Karamirza was our principal witness, among others. He came, testified in favor of having such legislation, went back to Russia, was poisoned, almost died. 2017, 
um, having survived that, our foreign affairs committee uh, reconvened, uh, again held hearings, which led to the adoption by Canada of Magnitsky legislation. He testified again, went back to Russia, was poisoned and almost died again. But he became a leading architect, having survived both those assassination attempts for Magnitsky legislation worldwide and, and led really the adoption of such legislation by the UK, uh, the EU, uh, as I said, Canada and, and the US and more recently uh, in Australia. Um, and, and many of these places we, we testified together, but he's been the leader. In he, After those assassination attempts, he moved his family from Russia to Washington uh, so that they would be safer there while uh, he became a columnist for the Washington Post. But when Putin invaded Ukraine, he felt he had to be back with his people. So he went back to Russia. And not long after coming back to Russia, he was arrested first on a trumped up charge of disobeying the police when he was just in his car about to leave to the airport to fly back to Washington. Then on a charge of uh, uh, speaking about the war, because Putin, having invaded Ukraine, also adopted a fake news law where you couldn't even speak about the war. And then more recently, um, charged with high treason. So it's it, 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 incredible. I mean, I've been tracking it. His case is very similar to the way Sharansky, same charges, same uh, you know, falsified evidence, uh, etc. So we've taken up his case and cause as a kind of looking glass to both domestic uh, repression in, in Russia, because there's been over 20,000 arbitrary detentions in Russia since the war began, along with what's happening in the Ukraine. So this has been a principal involvement of us in the Wallenberg uh, Center. And I have to tell you that I, I, I get courage from these political prisoners. Uh, they're the people who always inspired me. And, and in fact, you know, when I entered politics, I, I, I was a very, very reluctant MP. I mean, to, uh, reluctant to go in, into politics. I was somewhat influenced, ironically enough, by two political prisoners. Both Sharansky and Mandela told me that sometimes you have to enter the political arena, as they both did, in order to affect change. Uh, but the thing that caused me to do it, I have to tell you, was and when I was interviewed as to why I went into politics, I said one word, and they said what? I said, Rwanda. And they said, Rwanda? Why Rwanda? I said, because I, I'll never forget. I said, in 1994, when 10,000 Tutsis were being murdered every day for three months, and the bystander international uh, community, through its indifference and inaction, allowed this to happen. And I said to myself, if ever something like that arises again, I want to be on the inside trying to do something about it, then on the outside, pounding on doors with, with nobody listening. So that's why I went into parliament. But uh, if I may, just a joke, because my son, who has a very cynical sense of humor and who speaks about political leaders similarly to the way uh, you do, uh, when, uh, although he doesn't have uh, your inner peace, he's just more cynical. Uh, so when I was running for parliament, a journalist called him up and said, what do you think of your dad running for parliament? So he answered as follows, was front page of the paper. He said, I think my dad's crazy. He says, what does he want to go to parliament? Nothing ever happens there. They don't do anything. And if anything, some of them become corrupt. And there's a Mano Lewinsky waiting from around the corner. That was back in 1999 when I ran. And then typical sense of humor. When I got elected six weeks later, at the risk of sounding self-serving, with 92% of the vote, the same journalist called me and said, well, what do you think of your dad now? He got 92% of the vote. And he said, Donald Duck running in this riding for the liberals would have gotten 92% of the vote. My dad lost. That would have been a story. So he was quite uh, cynical. But I once tried to suggest to him, because he said, you know, maybe you should have stayed as a law professor at that. I said, you know, I love being a a law professor. I said that one difference, I said, is a law professor was an important ongoing educational seminar. But being an MP, I said you were involved in a 
decision-making process. You could impact on the lives of human beings. If you kept that at the forefront at all times and didn't let the politicization get you, saw yourself as a trustee of the people and not of a political party, I said, then you might be able to try uh, to achieve something as a kind of ombudsperson uh, for the writing that you represent, for the et cetera, causes you represent. So that's why I, I went in, into it. And when we, as you put it now, we need measurable impacts if we're going to do things. And I, I, I'm very worried now when what I see in terms, just reverting back to the Israeli-Palestinian situation, because on the leadership level, it's, it's difficult on both sides. Uh, but what you mentioned in terms of a public forum and what you spoke about, about the soul of leadership and that kind of uh, public forum, I think that may be necessary within each community and between communities. So, Erwin, again, every time I listen to you, it's so inspiring. And if there were enough parliamentarians, lawmakers with that kind of intention, I think we would see a different world. Um, is your son uh, the uh, uh, product of the same uh, you and your wife who introduced uh, you to uh, Begin? Well, we both, uh, we have four uh, children. He's the youngest. Uh, we have uh, three, uh, three girls. Uh, the eldest from my wife's first marriage actually uh, became herself a, a human rights lawyer, was uh, elected to the Knesset for one term, but then did not like it and, and decided not to run again. She just didn't, although I thought she was quite effective. My uh, next daughter uh, is also a lawyer, a human rights lawyer, and she recently became the uh, CEO of our Raoul Wallaber Center. By the way, she taught me, as I've said many times, one of the most important human rights lessons I've ever had when she was 15. She's now 42. When she said to me uh, one day, she said, Daddy, if you want to know what the test of human rights is, always ask yourself at any time, in any situation, in any part of the world, is it good for children? Is what is happening good for children? That's the real test of human rights, Daddy. Then, of course, she added, and you not being at home is not good for your children. <laughs> <laughs> and then my third daughter is very much in your shoes. Uh, she's a clinical psychologist who's now opening up a trauma center in Toronto that's going to involve, uh, you know, yoga and, and meditation and clinical, uh, you know, psychological treatment. But it's going to be a very in integrative, inclusive, uh, humanistic uh, model. And uh, I, I'm very excited about that. And she, she's one of your big admirers, I might, I might add. And she, I think she's read everything you've ever read. Now tell me about the son who is cynical. Uh, Where, son, what's son, he up to now? The cynical son is, is uh, in Israel, ended up in Israel. Uh, he became a lawyer, actually, uh, but he didn't want to practice law. And then he was very interested in counterintelligence. So he worked with the counterintelligence a couple of times. And then he told me, frankly, they're all corrupt. And so he left the counterintelligence. And as we're talking, I just spoke to him before. He just told me he decided to do something that I never thought he would do. And, I, and he just surprised me with it. He said, I, Dad, I decided I'm going to go ahead and get a, a PhD in uh, national security studies, or to use the term, you would say human security. He said, so, uh, well, that's I know you, Jonathan Granoff spoke about human security. That used to be my motto as a minister of justice, human that's, security. That's a lovely story, lovely story. So let's do this. Let's um, give Jay the responsibility now to see where we can take this conversation, both at a grassroots level and at your very effective level as well you know, which has to do with legislation, the United Nations, Jonathan Granoff's ideas. We need to pursue this in some way or another. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, Jonathan, if you can come up with uh, some ideas on 
next steps, even a visit to Israel to start this conversation. The, I will contact my people there to see if we can do something in general public, something that is not polarizing at all, something that uh, doesn't, uh, you know, uh, fight the darkness, but brings in some light, something that can expand this conversation to a bigger level, something that we can actually propose to the UN, to the political leaders of the world, but also to general public, so we can expand the conversation. As long as we expand this conversation and we can reach critical mass through media, through educational facilities, through political leaders, but also storytellers. We need modern day storytellers that include entertainers, poets, and humanitarians who can tell a new story. Otherwise, we are still engaging with uh, medieval minds and uh, modern capacities. And that's not a good combination, you know, to still have that medieval mindset and the capacities for destruction that we have now is, is a dangerous uh, recipe. Um, if, uh, if that is a good idea, then uh, uh, and if uh, Irwin agrees, then Jay and I can work through uh, an, uh, an agenda and a proposal for everyone, for the UN, for political leaders, but also engage general, the general public globally on, is it possible? Is it possible even to try to attempt to reach that critical mass of awareness that can together uh, be the change they want to see in the world and focus on a more peaceful, just, sustainable, healthier, and joyful society. I, I loved your framing the other day about love and action. I mean, yes. I think that uh, if we could start to pursue this uh, with, as you also put it, with measurable impacts, uh, that would be a really good step forward. I myself am uh, going at the beginning beginning of January, I'll be going to Israel uh, for two months. Um, what happened was I'm a special envoy, uh, kind of a special envoy for preserving Holocaust remembrance and combating anti-Semitism. I was appointed two years ago. My term was up uh, and I want to leave, but they asked me to stay on. So uh, I'm staying on until the end of end of March. But initially on the anticipation that I was going to be over at the end of December, I booked to spend some time with uh, working but, but with my children and, and grandchildren in Israel. So I'll be there in January and February, but I'm also going to make some attempts to uh, meet with civil society people on, on both sides, but also very much engaged in some of the groups in Israel that maybe some of those to whom you spoke, I'm not sure. Okay, very good, sir. I'll follow up on that.